I try to be charitable. I don't want to address the bad ideas of individuals unless they've deliberately rejected all offers I've made to be civil. This video was supposed to be a polite discussion with the individual who made the comment. However, that was not to be. The exchange went as follows. In a discussion that took place on an address of the history behind the founding of Asatru as a religion, an individual who shall remain nameless, why don't we call him Ed, made the following non sequitur regarding man being made in the image of God in both Christianity and Norse paganism. This opening comment, both Christians and Germanic followers of the old God believe God created them in their own image. Thus, the Germanic gods look Germanic and only allow Germanic peoples into their afterlife, the Germanic people being their creation and responsibility. I replied, and he continued, the concept goes back to Ask and Elma, who were created by the gods from ash and elm trees. The gods made their creation look much like themselves and gave them various gifts, and then Odin gave them the breath of life, and this was before the divine blood of the gods was in the veins of their creations. I replied, he ignored me, and continued, Odin and his two brothers, some of his brothers are not mentioned in Ask and Elma creation and are barely known. One of the names loosely translates into the Lord of Heaven, or Lord of the Winds, and has a Norwegian town named after him. Some of that is true. Germanic gods and Germanic tribes look like each other, and this is not uncommon among all kinds of native religions, and the blood of the gods first entered the Germanic people through the actions of Rig, who created the stupid, barely able to look after, or excuse me, who created the Germanic class system. Thralls, freemen, and Jarls. The y Thralls is someone portrayed as black-haired and stupid, barely able to look after him or herself. The low of the low. Poor health can darken the hair. The Germanic tribes had a presence in Russia and even helped make Russia strong enough to push back the mongrel, I think he meant to say Mongol, invasion, and is one of the theories of the origins of the thrall. I replied again, and he ignored me. Ancient history and the reality of the age and of the class system that was partly based upon race, with everyone having more freedoms than the black-haired. Since he never read my replies, you can read them on your own time. Hopefully, you can all conclude that I was clear and fair in my offer to him to clarify his position. However, since he ignored them, I'm forced to do this alone. Where did this theory of inferior races come from? The answer is the poetic Edis, specifically Rig's Thula. A bit of background before we read the relevant passages. It's important to note that there's a lot of confusion about this poem's primary characters. Rig is claimed by some to be Heimdall, who ironically was called the White God. Others that it was Odin, and whichever is the case, it ends up making the opposite claim for this poor soul. He claimed that the blood of the gods made the Germanic people superior and divided by a class system based on their hair color. Let's read the passage and see how the poem itself stands. This is the opening verses to Rigsthula. Men say there went by ways so green, of old the god, the age, the wise. Mighty and strong did Rig go, striding. Forward he went on the midmost way. He came to a dwelling, a door on its post. In did he fare. On the floor was a fire, two hoary ones. By the hearth there sat. I and Ida in olden dress. So, in short, Rig finds two prostitutes. We're already off to a great start. In verse 6, it goes on to note after his seduction of them. Thus was he there for three nights long, then forward he went on the midmost way. So you see this poetic structure here. And so nine months there soon passed by. A son bore Ida. With water they sprinkled him, with a cloth his hair so black they covered. Thrall they named him. The skin was wrinkled and rough on his hands, knotted his knuckles, thick his fingers, and ugly his face. Twisted his back and big his heels, he began to grow and to gain in strength. Soon of his might good use he made. With bast he bound and burdens carried. Home bore 
again. The whole day long, one came to their home, crooked her legs, stained were her feet, and sunburned her arms. Flat was her nose. Her name was Thier, and it goes on from there. It's worth noting that in the commentary of Sir Henry Adams Bellows on verse 7, where it notes that his cloth was his hair so black they covered, this is available for public reading in sacredtext.com. After line 1, the manuscript only has four words. So here's the direct translation from the actual manuscript. Cloth, black, named thrall. No gap anywhere is indicated. Editors have pieced out the passage in various ways, and it goes on to note water as a tradition long before baptism and dedication. He also cites Hovamol as an example. Black, or dark hair, among the blonde Scandinavians was the mark of a foreigner, hence a slave, thrall, or also known as slave. And we note that in verse 13, at the end of the verse, it notes that from thrall's descendants who are named came the race of thralls. So the text in its own literally read that the first offspring of the prostitute Edis, her name just means great-grandmother, cloth black named thrall. The poor presentation of this idea has left most to read into the text that it was describing his hair color, which culturally was the mark of a foreigner who were regularly enslaved, thus the association. The poem goes on to note that other children from Ama and Mothir, Ama produced Karl, whose children were farmers, and Mothir produced Jarl, whose children learned about things. This is Rigsthula, verse 21. A son born Ama, with water they sprinkled him, Karl they named him, in a cloth she wrapped him. He was ruddy of face, that's another term for red, and flashing his eyes. And it goes on in verse 25 to note the yeoman's race came from him, so farmers. Rigsthula, verse 34, says, A son had Mothir, in silk they wrapped him, with water they sprinkled him. Jarl he was, blonde was his hair, and bright his cheeks, grim as a snake's were his glowing eyes. And also note, nothing is mentioned about the race he produced due to the manuscript's basis being incomplete. So take of that what you will. What I want to draw attention to is the structure of each child's presentation after their birth, as well as their biological origin. Then we'll address the problems in this kind of thinking. Thrall structurally is introduced as what? Literally from the text. Ugly, wrinkled, twisted, strong. Carl is introduced as ruddy, bright eyes, and strong. Jarl is introduced as blonde, bright cheeks, and eyes. In the text, how are they introduced in the verses themselves? Thrall is cloth black named Thrall. Carl, cloth red named Carl. Jarl, Cloth silk named Jarl. Note the common poetic structure in how these individuals are being presented. Translation hasn't done us any favors. On top of appearance, what about their mothers? We have Thrall, whose mother was Edis, a prostitute. What, but you ask, well, what about Carl? Ama was his mother, who was a homeowner. Jarl, mother's Mothir, and that was a housewife. Who was their father? Well, all were rig through some form of adultery, in Edith's case, prostitution, but the point still stands. So from all of this information regarding them in the text, their appearance, their mothers, and their fathers, three questions I want to ask. If this is the foundation of the divinely ordained class system of the Nordic people, what is the basis by which you determine their place in society? It's not their father, since every class has had the same father, according to Rigsthula. It's not their family's reputation, or their own, because they were all products of adultery whose father went left to get milk. And it wasn't their productivity. All were strong and lived productive lives. The only distinction between them is presumed to be the hair color. And... 
the text doesn't actually state that. Second question is that if society is structured by appearance, what about black or red makes someone inferior to blonde? Dark hair, dark appearance, or dark cloth in which they're wrapped in, which would be the literal reading of this text, these are all superficial details that make no tangible impact on what they actually are. You can have a weak or unintelligent person with blonde hair. You can have smart people with dark hair. And along with the sacred tradition, there's no reason to infer or take out of the text what's actually happening. Third question is, if I were to deal with someone who made the same inferences to my scriptures, how should I respond? Should I assume that they're telling the truth or check out the text to see if it claims what they claim it says? Or if there are other texts that support that kind of conclusion? If you're interested in the terms used among fellow Christians, it would be the serpent seed doctrine or the mark of Cain, with two examples that are used by racial supremacists to claim the Bible makes a distinction between ethnicities. There's only two problems. You can name more, but let's start with the plain. The text they use to prove this, like Riggs Thula, say nothing of the sort. This is Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. We'll focus on the serpent seed doctrine, where it's claimed that the inferior races, the evil people of this world, whichever ethnicity they want to demonize, came from the seed of the woman and the serpent. They were the offspring of the serpent's copulation with her. Well, let's read the passage where their one and only interaction is noted. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So far their exchange is conversational. The woman replies to the snake, We, notice this, may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So, so far, the context and handling of the truth in the midst of the free of the garden is not being used as a euphemism for sex. In fact, if that were the case, then any of the other fruits of the tree of the garden would be sex in other forms, which is no way supported by any other handling of this passage or any Hebrew lexical source. Then the serpent said to the woman, you sh will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, food, <laughs> that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So again, if this is a euphemism for copulation with the snake, does that mean that Adam did it too? Or is this referring to a fruit with spiritual consequences because it involved disobedience to God? Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. First problem is that it's not in the text. The second problem is that in verse 11, God addresses them when they hide themselves from the presence of God because they were naked when he asked them. He said, to who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you you should not eat? He knows, but he's letting them bring it forward. The man said, the woman that you gave to me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Anything in this text regarding copulation or the production of offspring. Continuing on, going back to the first chapter of Genesis, verses 27 through 28, if you're going to say, and this is the inference made by those who handle this text in this way, oh, well, you know, this, again, you don't know the Hebrew, and this uh, whole mysterious euphemism that I'm inferring into the text is something that I can justify because Adam and Eve were not having sex in any regard. They didn't have offspring yet. 
right? Because sex always produces offspring. Let's see what Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 through 28 says in the explanation that sexuality and the sexual encounter is what was the grave sin here. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and of every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, why would God give them a command to do something and then also say that that was forbidden? It's making nonsense of the passage. So, continuing on with this, we also have yet another problem. The passage they would use to justify this interpretation have either been handled piecemeal or isolated from the complete statement in order to justify what they want it to ultimately claim. They've come to a conclusion, now look at the text, rather than look at the text and come to a conclusion. For example, in Deuteronomy 23 and verse 3, they say, well, yeah, the Bible's full of racially based isolation based off of what they are ethnically. Deuteronomy 23, 20, uh, verse 3 says, An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Problem is, chapter doesn't end in verse 3. Verse 4 says, Because they did not meet you, who? They. Who are the they? The Ammonites and Moabites, the one being addressed as not entering the assembly of the Lord. With food, bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt, a specific event historically in the book of Numbers, chapter 20. Interesting. And because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you, orchestrating the lives or the deaths of thousands of people. That's uh, interesting. So it's not a matter of what they are, it's what they've done. Continuing on, there's another problem. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 3, when it says, You shall make... Uh, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to your son or their daughter for your son. And then they leave it there and say, See, interracial marriages, forbidden. For what reason? Verse 4, For they shall turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. We can also note that in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 10, it notes that the Messiah, the root of Jesse, will stand as a banner to the people for the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, will hope in him. His resting place shall be glorious. Why is the Jewish Messiah reaching out to non-Jewish people if the Bible makes it so that any non-Jewish ethnicity is forbidden? It's almost as if the handling of the text is inconsistent. We can also look at the book of Ruth, where a Moabite is not only shown favorably, but marries into the Messianic line. We have record of that in Matthew 1 and in Luke 3. We also have the book of Joshua, where a Canaanite tribe of Gibeonites are spared because they asked. And not only that, but they serve in the temple of God. Rahab, likewise, an individual Canaanite, is spared because she asked and is married into the Messianic line as well. So what's interesting about all of this is that when I'm handling the text, other passages conflict with my interpretation. Now, unfortunately, the Edis doesn't give me that same luxury, but here is my point. If your interpretation conflicts with reality, you either have a bad interpretation or a bad belief system. The Bible can stand up to scrutiny when idiots, and I mean that, get a hold of it. I believe in this matter concerning the Edis as well. The problem is which religion encourages more critical thinking. The one with information against these kind of interpretations or the one that allows special ed over here to justify colorism? I'll leave that in your hands. I want to thank you all for listening to this study. I hope it has been edifying. For all of you, if you have sincere questions, ask them. If you'd like to encourage the ministry, do so. I'll look forward to further engagements, hopefully more polite ones and more informed ones in the future. And also note that the invitations to host pagans, to clarify their views and allow them to be criticized in a polite, respectful manner, is not a bluff. By all means, take advantage. 
I'm looking forward to further engagements with you, but once again, as is my exhortation, if you want a religion that not only stands against colorism, but also against these poor interpretations used to justify it, I have to recommend Jesus Christ. I look forward to talking to you all again. Until then, next time, we will see you all then. Not in the wig. <laughs>